Wrestling Bites. It's NES Works episode 37. March 1987 brings us our third wrestling game for NES. If that seems like a bit of overkill, consider this. It may be the third wrestling game for the console, but it's the first one that's actually worth playing. We're also about to witness the end of the line for Nintendo's Black Box series, with the final four releases clad in that particular iconic branding hitting in rapid succession. This release in particular makes a strong case for first-party releases moving along from that look. The black box packaging style has become one of gaming's most recognizable retro visual icons. I'd argue there's no box art format that is better known or more widely parodied, at least in the US. Homages to it show up on book jackets, t-shirts, homebrew NES games, band posters, you name it. However, it also speaks to a specific era of games, one that the NES in 1987 had frankly moved beyond. The idea behind the black box, I think, was a smart one. Nintendo wanted to set its games apart from what had come before. Rather than cover up games with fanciful, painted interpretations that presented an unrealistic impression of what the graphics and gameplay would actually deliver, as you saw on Atari and in television, the black box showed you exactly what you were getting. Austere black packaging emblazoned with a faithful, if not 100% accurate, representation of the actual game graphics made certain there were no hurt feelings when kids got home and ended up with something much less exciting than the box had suggested. At the same time, the sprite paintings showed off the NES's power relative to its predecessors. These weren't the primitive stickmen of the Intellivision, oh no. They had color and volume and detail, albeit less detail than the box art would have you believe. By 1987, the NES had made serious inroads into the US market, and the novelty of seeing a video game system at retail again had already begun to fade. Moreover, games were growing more detailed and complex than the early black box launch releases. The elaborate backgrounds and Trojan, for example, are something you just didn't see in those initial titles, but they're fast becoming standard fare. So the black box had served its purpose. Pro wrestling in its opening moments underscores that fact. Rather than kicking off with the usual simplistic ditty over a title screen followed by a few seconds of silent demo play, pro wrestling launches into a rockin' musical theme that introduces its cast of wrestlers alongside detailed portraits. This is a step beyond anything we've seen in a black box game before, in terms of presentation and confidence. Nintendo's first party software lineup crosses a threshold here, and in doing so it's arguably kicking off the second generation of NES releases. Eh, unless you want to reserve that honor for Gradius or Trojan. It's fine, this isn't an exact science. Pro Wrestling is pretty great though. It's a vastly better game than Muscle, or Tag Team Wrestling, that's for sure. But then why wouldn't it be? This is the work of a gaming legend. Masato Masuda, creator of the Fire Pro Wrestling series and basically gaming's gift to wrestling fans. So far as I'm able to determine, Pro Wrestling for NES appears to be Masuda's first significant work, which would make sense as he wasn't even 50 years old when he passed away in 2014. He would have been college aged at the time of Pro Wrestling's debut on Famicom as Pro Wrestling Famicom Wrestling Association. I found a few different explanations online of the exact provenance of Pro Wrestling's creation. Some sources credit the development to a contractor called Try, which would evidently later evolve into human entertainment. While Wikipedia makes an unsourced claim that Masuda single-handedly designed and programmed the game as an employee of Nintendo R&D 3 before departing to join Try. On the other hand, Japanese literate Famicom history expert Kevin Gifford seems confident that this was a Try joint created under contract, so let's go with that. Whatever the truth, there's no denying that pro wrestling represents a huge step forward for the genre. VideoWorks has already hit on one wrestling game by Try, under its later name of Human Entertainment, on Game Boy Works by way of HAL Wrestling. And while these two games are fairly different in terms of particulars, pro wrestling does share a lot in common with that later creation. This isn't a perfect interpretation of the sport, but it captures both the mechanics and the pageantry of pro wrestling far more cannily than any video game that had come before it. Players can choose from six different competitors and work their way up through the ranks by doing all the horrible things a professional wrestler does to his competitors. Grapples, holds, throws, roundhouse kicks, running clotheslines off the ropes, leaping onto a downed opponent from the posts. Pro wrestling has it all. 
you can even chuck your foe outside the ring for a potential disqualification. As with the other NES wrestlers we've seen, pro wrestling revolves around whittling down the opponent's stamina in order to be able to pin them down for the count. Its control scheme is vastly more nuanced than that of muscle, while at the same time avoiding the idiotic menu scheme of tag team wrestling. While Masuda would greatly refine the system for the Fire Pro games, this here is a solid baseline for the genre. The biggest shortcoming here is that timing doesn't really factor into the action, so it's easy to spam attacks. You can definitely see this when facing off against the CPU, which, surprise, cheats like a jerk. It's all too easy to find yourself helplessly stuck in a loop as the computer knocks you down and immediately dominates you once you stand up again before you're able to register an input to counter or evade. But eh, this isn't really a game meant to be played versus the CPU. Even more so than the other sports games we've seen on NES, pro wrestling shines in two-player mode. To some degree, this is because 8-bit sports games are always a lot more fun against another person than against a limited AI. But it's also because the six wrestlers here are each charismatic and interesting and a lot of fun to play as. Pro wrestling's lineup is what you might call a motley assortment. A strange and almost nonsensical mix of typical US and Japanese style pro wrestlers, along with a few more colorful characters. There's the bright pink luchador Starman, and everyone's favorite heel, the bizarre Amazon. Every wrestler employs essentially the same moveset, but each one puts his own spin on things. Korean champion Ken Korn Karn, for example, uses karate chops and flying kicks in place of the standard punches and roundhouse kicks. Of course, everyone loves the Amazon the most because he's a dirty bastard. Rather than putting opponents into a suplex or other standard hold, the Amazon transitions from grapples to an absolutely painful looking headbite. He's basically the prototype for Street Fighter's Blanca, and he's the clearest heel wrestler in the entire game. It's not enough that he's apparently a green skinned monster, he's also absolutely savage in the ring. The Amazon's poor dumb rivals, like the obvious tan and blonde Hulk Hogan proxy Great Panther, never stood a chance. Pro wrestling is a game about five boring guys and the Amazon grappling for supremacy. Even if the Amazon is the obvious star here, yes, despite there being a guy named Starman, the game seems determined to make Japanese wrestler fighter Hayabusa the protagonist. He's the default character in single player mode, and he's the first CPU opponent you have to fight when you play as any character besides fighter Hayabusa. Which is fine, this is a Japanese game, so it makes sense to give the local hero top billing. But still, he's no Amazon. There's some real meat to this game, enough so that even someone who recoils in horror from the sight of professional wrestling, like myself, can appreciate the fact that it's more than just some superficial take on the sport. As black box games go, this is the most substantial one we've seen outside of Super Mario Bros. Which makes sense because it originally debuted in Japan as a disc system title, meaning it had a lot more memory capacity to work with than something like, say, baseball. Pro Wrestling remains one of the most beloved NES releases of this era, and for good reason. The professional wrestling craze had really hit the US in earnest right around the time pro wrestling debuted, and this was a colorful, intricate take on the concept by the standards of 1987. So as with Trojan, we have here a game that would be done better by others in the future, but which served as an essential milestone in the evolution of the NES library. Unlike Trojan though, pro wrestling is still the kind of game that's fun to play drunk at a party, which makes it about as close to timeless as you're going to find in a black box game. Also in March 1987, we had a few other sports-themed black box titles. First, there was Soccer. There seems to be some debate over the exact launch timing of Soccer. A few sources claim it was a launch game back in 1985, though Nintendo's own official records indicate it was an 87 release. Certainly it feels more like a game that would have appeared around launch. It features characters drawn in the now dated visual style of baseball and tennis. Admirable back in 1985, but already hopelessly primitive by 1987. After all, not only had NES software advanced considerably since the console's launch, it no longer had sole possession of the field. Both Sega and Atari had impressive competing systems on the market in 1987, the technically superior Master System from Sega and the reliable 7800 from Atari. Neither of these consoles would come close to matching Nintendo's dominance of the US market, they certainly upped the stakes for visual and technical fidelity. The little dudes on the field in soccer looked tragic next to pro wrestling's lanky characters and the detailed sprites of something like Sega's Great Soccer, which also debuted in 87. Anyway, this is pretty much what you'd expect from a 1987 8-bit soccer game. It's an extremely light simulation that allows you to take the field as one of seven international teams. You control an entire team simultaneously, although most of the time you only have direct control over a single highlighted player who moves in tandem with the goalie on your side of the field and your targeting arrow for shooting into the opponent's goal. 
When you pass the ball, you can switch control to the nearest player by tapping B. You have some simple tactics at your command. You dribble the ball forward toward the opponent's goal while trying to evade defenders. When the other team has the ball, you can attempt to reclaim possession, though you can't be too aggressive or you'll be carded. And that's about it. It's soccer done in a basic fashion. One thing I will hand to this adaptation, unlike some of the other black box sports adaptations we've seen, it's fairly friendly to casual players. It offers an array of difficulty settings and time commitments that keep the AI from being too unfair and the mundane gameplay from feeling too drawn out. I realize this boring game doesn't overstay its welcome as faint praise, but it's better than you'll find in a lot of middling sports adaptations from this era. For example, it's better than you'll find in volleyball. Unlike soccer, volleyball offers only a single difficulty level against the computer, and it's crushingly difficult. Here you can play as a completely offbeat selection of international teams. You have obvious Olympic mainstays like the US and Japan, but also dark horse picks like Tunisia. Whichever team you select, the computer will destroy you. Volleyball is tough because it's fast paced, but also because the semi-automatic gameplay is a mess. As in soccer, this is a team sport where you have only direct control over a few players at a time. Unlike soccer though, you have no input over which characters you control. The computer automatically determines which team members fall under your direct input as each turn proceeds, and it all seems very opaque. The hardest part of this game, in fact, is the fact that players closest to the ball often remain inert, and you're forced to send active players scrambling to cover for them. Of course, overall, volleyball plays like, well, volleyball. You send a ball back and forth over a net via, you know, volleys. Your team has three hits in which to get the ball to the other side, and a lot of the game revolves around setting up hard attacks and spikes over the nets. Spikes are weirdly difficult to execute thanks to the timing involved, and even the CPU has trouble pulling them off consistently. They're effectively the ultimate tactic here though. Thanks to the clumsy controls and the way the ball movement can be difficult to predict perfectly, a hard overhand return is pretty much unstoppable. It's also worth noting that aside from the apocryphal ladies golf for the versus system, this is the only NES black box sports title to allow you to use female avatars. The default team here is women, though men's volleyball is also available. I can't really recommend playing as men though. That's not sexism, it's just the animation. The two-frame animation for characters is kind of a cute little butt wiggle for the ladies, but a frankly obscene looking pelvic thrust for men. To my knowledge, volleyball marks the NES debut of developer Pax Softnica. We've seen Pax Softnica on Game Boy Works. They did the heavy lifting on the wonderful Balloon Kid. Volleyball marks the beginning of their 15-year relationship as a Nintendo development partner, a la HAL in Minakuchi Engineering. Interestingly, the company's programmer gets a credit on the title screen here which is quite unusual. You never see individuals credited on the title screen to first-party Nintendo games. And like pro wrestling, volleyball debuted in Japan as a disc system title, but it seems to have made its way to cartridge with no particular compromises. Really though, there's not much to say about volleyball. Aside from its production trivia, it doesn't do anything to set itself apart, and it has no particular place of importance in the NES catalog. This is the sort of game whose time is rapidly coming to an end on NES, as a new wave of deeper, prettier, more substantial software begins to crash against the shores of video game history. The Black Box series served its purpose and served it well, but now it's time to move on to bigger and better things. So next episode, we'll say farewell to Black Boxes with the final chapter, a game that actually does matter. <laughs>